And we're live. Hello and welcome everyone to uh, the Live World of Warhammer. As I'm casually typing it in the Discord now that we're going live, ran out a bit quick. <laughs> um, with us today, we've got the Legends of the Law. Uh, we've got Lachlan from Legends and Law. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, hey, mate. I'm good. How you doing? Good, man. Good. And we've got the Law King himself, Magnus's favorite son, Josh. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. Good. Hopefully, we that expectation. Hey. Ah, <laughs> oh, look. Look, I, I, I'm sure I'll ask the question later on. And then the man who did nothing wrong, I mean, not, not alluding <laughs> to anything at all, but <laughs> um, so, uh, allegedly. <laughs> so tonight we're going to talk about the lore and the narrative behind Warhammer. So obviously covering, generally, I'm sure, covering more than 40,000 space because that's the area mm. we're in, but covering, I guess, all narrative lore and um, what it means to people. So uh, as someone who doesn't really appreciate the lore that much, um, want to find out from these two so-called pros um what's the law is all about and <laughs> go from there so the people have read and listened to the whole horror heresy back to cover read for the wikipedias made edits and they know everything inside and out so i guess we'll test some knowledge and see how we go but before we get like deep dive into the law um josh so people who aren't aware so um how'd you get into 40k and like what what makes you so called horror heresy or warhammer the expert in the lore right. at least a lot of us would remember a little game called Dawn of War, I think, <laughs> so, about 15, 20 odd years ago. And it, um, my mate introduced me as it typically goes. You know, he says, Look at this great game. Here we go. And it's been tw almost 20 years since. <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of silly spends. I think my first kit, I, um, Chaos Space Marines. So I picked up a little metal Blister, the Raptor. They used to come in little metal packets. You could throw them at your mate if, <laughs> if you rolled bad. And it's just been going ever since, man. Just absolutely love it. Happy days, happy days. So, and just playing the game as well as reading, sure, or listening to many books along the way. So, happy days indeed. Uh, what about yourself, Lachlan? So, someone I actually finally met, met at VTC last year, yeah. learned about you guys, and um, now we get the pleasure to talk again. So, how did you get into 40K, though, for people who aren't aware? Oof. So, uh, the classic story of, you know, someone introduces you in high school and then you don't really have the capacity and then you kind of suddenly gain income as a 20-something year old and then you're like, oh, wow, I can waste it on this stuff. So, <laughs> I, uh, a bunch of mates kind of uh, pushed me into it when I was about 21 and they just had huge armies, big terrain setups, a lot of their stuff looked fantastic and they threw a Horus Heresy book at me and I was sucked in forever. So, yeah, just couldn't help with that. <laughs> Ticked all the right just, the, just the warp took you in and just never sp uh, spat you out. You've just been consumed ever since. Absolutely, mate. Chaos forever. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the one and true way. So, um, but to get started, so um, guys, obviously both uh, law fanatics and law fans, Um, but Josh, for people who aren't aware, so like what got you into law? Like how did you start, sort of start reading it? Obviously Dawn of War games, I'm sure some of those fun sayings, like uh, the capital on the way was it that or what got you into the law have you always been like a reader or a listener yeah big reader um obviously time sort of decreases as you get into an adult but i actually started with white dwarf i um when i first started white dwarf was the easier way to get the content you know youtube wasn't quite as big as it these days says and i remember my first battle report in white dwarf was this big apocalypse battle and it um had tower versus blood angels and imperial guard and he was a big bane blades like Lachlan said, right, I was 13 at the time. I didn't have money to buy these things. They were 20 bucks a blister pack. So, the, you know, they sort of hooked me in. You know, I, I still remember that battle report. I remember at one point a, um, a chaplain threw a vortex grenade and eight, eight battle suits. And I was so intrigued. I was this is fantastic. You know, I, I want more of this. You know, what's this about? And it's mm. sort of just, you know, I love being able to sort of reflect that narrative on the tabletop. It may not necessarily be, you know, outlining an entire story, but it might be that you name your captain um, in our recent crusade, I had um, Crovas. He was the master of puppets, which is a Talica song, but, you know, each their own. And he, um, yeah, every time he got a kill, I was ecstatic. And every time he died, I was dismayed and swearing at my opponent. You know, it um, really adds some depth to your games. Yeah, it's been fantastic. I mean, that's how I have a go in. And then, obviously, Audible. I've got big, long trips to work, about an hour commute every day. So Audible just makes the content so easy to consume. It's just a ridiculous amount of books out there for anyone. There's something for everyone. Yeah, more than fair. Um, was it simply, is it only the 40K lore you listen to? Or do you listen to, I guess, the old school Warhammer Fantasy, Age of Sigma, and like, like Necromunda and stuff um, like that? Horus Heresy and 40K mainly. I've tried Age of Sigma. It, um, when it first came out, I thought, oh, we'll give it a go. It came across very Action Man comic -y. It was, you know, here comes the Knight Relictor with his three-plus save and a giant two-handed hammer available at GW 1995. 
Um, <laughs> couldn't quite get into it. It's improved a lot since then, um, but I haven't given it another go. It's mainly, yeah, that 40K and age assist, um, sorry, then 30K for sure. No, nah, more than fair, more than fair. And obviously, like a line that's been quite established for a long time now, but um, and so obviously found its feet. So, but I'm sure hopefully Age of Sigmas found its feet a bit more. I know there's like Warhammer Adventure books and stuff like that for kids, and we'll see how it goes in the future. Um, what about yourself, mm-hmm. Lachlan? Are you like a 30k horror heresy and 40k man, or um, do you listen to a bit of everything or listen or read a bunch of everything? Oh, for me, it definitely started with the heresy. Um, someone threw that at me pretty early on and I, I think I absorbed six or seven books in like three months four months something like that I just I ate them up absolutely consumed them my mates had a whole whole uh ton of them like and at, at the time there was about 30 books or something so I just got sucked right into that and uh but after that I kind of decided to branch out I picked up like the Blood Angels omnibus that was awesome um there's a Drukari book that's in the the Path of series that that was oh, so good very visceral as well and uh I, I love that but after that i really got drawn into the total war warhammer f- like games and total war was my jam and then they added warhammer to it so <laughs> that hooked me and i've been like quite interested and intrigued by fantasy law for quite some time now i've played two or three thousand hours of that game and th- there's so much like lore tidbits and stuff in that that i watched heaps of like content creators talking about the new things that were coming out the dlc that was likely to come out and why and what units were coming and oh it's just so juicy and meaty but you know i didn't really understand at the time that a lot of that those characters it's like a huge timeline that they all like exist in they don't actually exist together so that's a really cool universe though but i'm, I'm a bit the same as josh i found the aos lore a bit like forced it doesn't i don't know it didn't really grab me and the whole idea for like the fantasy world blowing up and then becoming what it is. And it just never sat with me. So, you know, didn't really get sucked into that. Sure. That's fair enough. I mean, hopefully maybe we get some new law. I'm sure it will with the old world and stuff like that. So mm, I'm sure please. old school Warhammer fantasy battles players will just consume all that right in. And uh, it sounds like you were one of those people, Lachlan, who would watch like, the conspiracy and rumor mill videos for <laughs> kind of War Warhammer's like, well, we saw this snippet or this quote, what could it mean? <laughs> Absolutely, man. I used to work at a petrol station and um, I'd be doing night shifts listening to like some dude at 11 a.m and oh, sorry 11 p.m at night just like oh because we saw this rock in the corner of this trailer that means that this guy's coming and <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could have something to kill your time with right absolutely absolutely i know when total war warhammer 3 came out like people are speculating oh, chaos dwarves are coming because they looted this and this and this and then i bet mm. you they came out so uh look Sometimes they're right, but you know, most of the time they're wrong. Sometimes Sorry, they're <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're completely off. Uh, what Absolutely. yourself, Josh? Do you like to be? It sounds like Dale Summers called you out, called, saying you're a serial pest in the club section of the Du Forty K Discord, <laughs> which you can join oh. for free. Um, is that like, is that a thing? Are you just correcting people wrong, or are you sprouting your own conspiracy? Theories? No, no, just um, you know, sharing the excitement. Paul's also a serial pest. He and I both. Are always <laughs> in there talking about something. Um, no, it's just a good spot in the um, Discord to just be excited about the books. I know Nathan loves his. He's going through Gotrick and Felix. And he's been on and out of that. Um, just recommending books to other people. Like, there's so much content out there, and uh, naturally, there's a lot of hits and there's a lot of misses. And uh, the audiobooks don't come cheap, so it's good to have a bit of advice in there and sort of share. A lot of people as well are trying to um, find a place to start because when you look at the content, Horace Heresy's 50 plus books. And you've got, you know, it's a whole publishing company dedicated to this game about plastic soldiers we push around the battlefield and set up trees to hide behind. Um, it can be a bit overwhelming, especially um, a lot of people, like, I don't know, some people feel ashamed about how they get into law. They're like, oh, I watch YouTube videos, you know, I should read books. And at the end of the day, however you consume that content, I said, if you enjoy listening to people make fun of the law, like I know a lot of people love the, um, the computer generated, I can't remember the name right now, the... Um, Someone will, you know what I mean. If that's how you get into there with um, Magnus doing nothing wrong and Dawn sitting on the Emperor's lap and cuddling him, (laughs) text to speech, there's the one. Um, If that's how you like your law, more power to you. There's not just one way. A lot of people seem to think that's through the books. There's so many other ways to enjoy the law. 
Yeah, absolutely. And as someone who's a proud, I'll put my hand up and say, I tried to listen to some books or try and read them and then got like a chapter in. And I was like, I'm done. This is too much. But like consumed all law content through YouTube videos. I mean, so, some of us just, it is what it is. So ah, I mean, there's so much out there and you sort of touched on there, Josh. Um, but Lachlan, so like for people who want to get into the law, like what sort of advice would you give? Because as alluded to, the Horace Heresy has like 50 plus books and... um. <laughs> I'm sure there's a, uh, unfortunately we don't have the image on screen, but the whole like flow chart of where the books line up and where they leak is just incredible. But like you're, you're, you're young Lachlan, how do you get people into the Horus Heresy or try and get them into the 40K law or 30K mm. law, I should say, more specifically? I actually think the best place to start is your own codex because the codexes are actually packed full of juice. So you know, if you're young and kind of getting into it and not sure where to start, you've already got a codex if you've, you know, acquired your rules by the traditional legal means. And uh, that's, they're great. There's a, there's a lot of really cool stories in there and they're stories that they've decided matter to the rules at the time and for that edition. And uh, I agree with Josh though, the Audible like collection is amazing because I used to consume books like a, you know, symbiotic leech on something's back. But these days I don't have that time. And so being able to like listen to a, a narrative play out while I'm driving or doing other stuff, that really helps because you can actually do two things at once that way. You don't feel like you're missing out on something. So, you know, I, I totally agree. Audiobooks are awesome. Yeah, absolutely. One like one way, like when you're doing like a monotonous thing, like driving or like riding a bike mm -hmm. or just something to pass in the background. Like I am a massive podcast addict, so audiobooks are definitely one of the best ways to do it. Um, what about yourself, Josh? Like, what would you advice would you give for someone who's interested in the law and trying to get into it? Um, what how how would you get in? Um, if I was starting these days, if I was a new person trying to get in, I would um, definitely start with YouTube. There are so many great content creators out there with little primers that introduce you. Um, obviously, Total Biscuit used to love Warhammer. He, I don't know if anyone remembers Total Biscuit. He had a 40K in 60 seconds that used to sort of introduce you to the universe. I think Horus Heresy is not a... Obviously, Lachlan, you got in a different way than I did, but Horus Heresy is probably not the place to start. You know, Horus Heresy loses some of its meaning if you don't understand the 40k settings. So I would, yeah, the codex is a great point, Lachlan. I um, we're all been guilty of getting our codex, taking the shrink wrap off, and going straight to the army rules. Let's be honest, we've just flicked straight through. Like, what's the other page? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Anyways, um, so I'd honestly, yep. So you great say. primers, great primers on YouTube. Um, people who put a lot of time and effort into some high quality content that can even just give you started. You know, especially when you've even just starting 40k in general. They've all stood there at the shelf and gone, oh, you know, all these models are so cool. I've got no idea where to start. And that's sort of where I picked my armies. You know, I love the law of chaos. Um, disgr <laughs> disgruntled old men fits right in with me. Um, that's basically, and obviously just enjoy the content how you enjoy it. Like I said before, it's sort of, I'm just repeating myself here a bit. Um, no, I, I like that is, point. I like yeah. that point, man. Yeah. Like um, I heard someone recently saying that like the hobby is so vast that you've got to enjoy it your way. And I totally agree. Absolutely. Um, probably the other thing I'd say is, like you've said, Sam, um, don't be disheartened if you get a book and you don't like it. Like I said, there are probably 30 plus authors over hundreds and hundreds of novels. You, there's, you're going to pick up a book and sometimes you're not going to like it. You know, feel free to try again. Obviously, if it's not for you, it's not for you. Try something else. I have, um, I have a mate who enjoys the little law snippets in the codex. There's just those little boxes in the corner about Captain Forehead who charged the tyranny line, you know what I mean? Like people like consume it differently, just whatever gets you into it, I suppose. That more than fair, more than fair. Um, speaking of authors that we have, uh, perennial pest Dale, so I'm not asking. So, in the Black Library series, so obviously for 40k, Horace Heresy, Age of Sigmar, there's a bunch of authors, so it's sort of unique in the sense of that. Um, there's a wider range of authors. Um, obviously, you hear about your Dan Abner, Aaron Dembski Bowden, who produce a bunch, but there's also a wide variety who get contracted to produce books. Um, so, starting with yourself, Lachlan, who's like one of your favorite authors of, I guess, uh, 40k content or horror series content will allow it? Um, and maybe what's what's your least favorite? Like, who's someone you just don't get into? <laughs> um, I've got to say, if, if we're talking authors. Graham McNeil keeps writing my favorite books. So uh, he's, a, he's an absolute boss. ADB is fantastic. Um, and obviously Dan Abnett is a legend, but Chris Rate writes some really awesome stuff too. And 
Oh, there's a, oh, there's a few guys. You know when you just see a name and you go, that that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of those from like the Heresy series where, you know, just so many of the books are so well written. Uh, as far as lore for content creators, I don't really have anyone to kind of shit on, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't like it when it's too slow. There's one or two content creators out there who is just their style. It takes too long to say anything or they then put their opinions about the law in us. I don't care. Just, just give me the law. <laughs> and so, you know, that's generally what I'm after. And um, strangely, sometimes even Valrak, he might go off a bit, but he gets me excited because he's so excited about 40K. If I'm ever in a slump or feeling a bit kind of grotty, sometimes I watch one of his videos and his ridiculous enthusiasm gets me back in. And sometimes he kind of does a bit of like recent lore and, surprisingly it just hits the spot sometimes so you know whatever floats your boat more than fair more than fair oh, was there an author that you just can't get the style of or was it more people that just that slow churn and slow build up i haven't had an author yet that i thought no nah, i didn't like that book um so no nah, nothing at the nothing comes to mind really yeah no nah, fair enough uh, what about yourself josh a favorite author and maybe not so favorite author um, we'll start with my not so favourite. John French is one I really struggle to get into sometimes. He, um, it's sort of like an old fashioned thing. He loves to sort of refer to, um, like the ammunition's cooked off and exploded. And once I've noticed that, I notice how often it's sort of repeated. So trying to read through some of the early, later Horus Heresy stuff, it sort of gets me the like, progression or he loves the metaphors, which don't really carry on into the other book. So it's a bit jarring sometimes trying to read it. If you've read through the Siege of Terror, you might understand he has two of the books and they're probably my least two favorite of the series in the, uh, in the Siege. Obviously, everyone's got different opinions. Um, and my favorites, probably up there between Chris Wright and Aaron Dembski. Aaron Dembski is going to be a favorite for a lot of people. He um, characterizes characters i suppose really really well shows growth gives them depth um you know sort of rewrote abaddon a bit which is obviously the chaos shining star and chris Wright, he um he single-handedly pretty much put white scars on the map especially in the heresy series no one really touched white scars they let him go the guy you know they just ride bikes they wear white armor whatever but he really took that and made it his own which is pretty cool to see hell yeah lachlan throwing up some uh of signs of approval there so what is it i guess you mentioned that chris Wright's one of your favorites so what is it about like those aaron nevsky bowden and chris Wright that makes these books so to life josh alluded to their personalities and how they bring the characters to life but what is it that some of these favorite authors do well you think lachlan i i think it's the um the depth definitely brings you in but it's the detail within the depth that i think really paints the picture because, you know, after you kind of get used to what 40K is and the factions, et cetera, et cetera, you realize there's, you know, 20 or so different factions out there and all those factions have sub-factions and blah, 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 blah. And then they have vast feet, fleets for each of these sub-factions, sub sorry, factions. <laughs> um, but it's the depth, like when they're kind of describing in detail, like, you know, you've got these vast armadas and yet you're focused on one guy who's going on his like a little personal voyage and then all the detail that's involved in like what he's doing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's what really gets me. I'm a big sucker for the vastness of a universe, but it's a detail that I, I quite like. I think that's why I come back to it so much. That's a fair point. You sort of look at it, you know, how many times have you read, you know, this battle hangs on this one guy and you really care about that guy, but how many times is that repeated throughout the galaxy? You know, mm. Calgar could, everyone goes, you know, what if Calgar died? then someone else would, you know, Sicarius would step up and it would just move on sort of thing. But they still do make you care about those characters. You know, there's always someone else lined up. It's a galaxy of billions and billions of people. But they do make you care about that character. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, like, my all-time favourites are uh, Forever First Heretic. I've absorbed, like, I've read it or listened to it a few times and it's amazing. It's really just one dude's story. Yes, you get to see a bit about the the Wordbearers Legion and stuff, but it's, it's Argyle Tale all the way. And you just follow this dude and his journey and like what he goes through and you know mvp such a great story uh, that that's fantastic and it's great to hear like the character film and like the the person on personal view uh, but I'll, I'll say this will head like spoilers for everyone like the i can't control these two lore experts and what they may or may not reveal so uh, just so, like spoilers ahead and it's funny you talked about that person on there i know i couldn't tell you the book but one of the favorite antidotes i always hear about uh, one person's perspective is 
um, I think it's some sister of silence or some model, and you hear, hear this whole story about how they developed or how they're going. Paul Jim probably probably butchered this whole story, but then I think you get the other perspective. <laughs> I think it's Angron or like it's Angron or someone, and he just comes by and just swashes this whole character you've developed a story of, and it, it's like no, even <laughs> a second. Calm. I can't, who, calm. There you go. Calm. Yeah. The yeah all he knows is his kill counter went up by one, and he keeps going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like fantastic, and like as you mentioned, like uh, the story from my perspective is this, but in reality, it's just like I just killed someone. It's, you don't matter. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so you could, um, so obviously we, we've just talked about some of the our love for Warhammer lore, but Josh, what is it about the lore that gives you an? Is it the vastness? Is it the character development? Or like, what gets you so excited and happy to listen to Audible and um and books about the Horus Heresy in 40k? Like, what is it about the lore that makes you so happy? It's definitely the setting and obviously the gameplay helps a lot too. Like I said, I really value having that model on the table and sort of putting some meaning behind it. You know, I don't spend, when you think about the, the hobby in general, probably playing games for most people is probably the least amount of time you spend in the hobby. You spend an hour building the model, then you prime it and then you paint it and then you base it. You know, when you really look at it, you probably spend 20% of your time actually playing those games. So I really like to get out of those games sort of, I said, I've, I name my characters in Crusade. We do a lot of, um, we have done a lot of Crusade, sort of waiting for the new edition to drop. It does get a bit, um, bit heavy on the end, but the setting, you know, are just um, sort of hard to describe. But, you know, once you're in, it's sort of hard to see out. Um, the characters that the, you build up, like we've said before, you know, Khan's one of three hundred thousand world eaters, one of eighteen legions. You know, why do you care about this guy? You shouldn't, but you do, sort of thing, right? And you go. Mm. Um, it's definitely the characters in the setting for me. You know, just keep dragging me back in. What about yourself, Locker? What brings you back to the Warhammer law time and time again to like keep listening to more and more books um, as they come out? I think it's the overlap. And like I, I got sucked in the same way to like the MCU and all the Marvel stuff. It's it's that you care about that one character, right? You care about Khan or you care about Argyle Tal in that book. And then they cross over and you're like, oh, wow. How mad is that? And then like some of the other characters from other books you cared about two or three years ago, then pop up in another book and you go, oh, cool. Look at this. Like how interesting is that interaction? And so I, I love the, like the meshing and the weaving of all these different stories together. Cause yes, the heresy might be vast, but if you're, you know, if you've never touched it or tried it, just start a book at a time. You'll either like it or you won't. And if you do manage to get a few books deep, it, it becomes really rewarding when you see all these different storylines and plots weaving around each other to the point where sometimes you don't even remember who that guy is when he comes back. <laughs> You're like, I'm, I know I'm supposed to remember who you are and you're really important, but I've been, <laughs> I read that 10 years ago and I got no idea. <laughs> It sounds like you nod an approval, Josh. Does that happen from time to time to time? Very much like, so. Oh, or even just yeah. it's actually actually a fair point. I hadn't really considered the um the weaving of the stories like Talos, he's a um the main protagonist, I suppose, of the Night Lord series. But when he appears in a thirty K book, I'm like, you know, I'm in the car with a big grin on my face. And I'm like, why would I why do I care about this guy? He's one bloke of the Night Lord's Legion. You know, it's true though. I never really thought of that aspect of it. So like when you've uh, <laughs> But you come to know it, right? Like you, yeah, absolutely. Like, you get to know their story and like what they're about and like, you know, it's kind of like meeting a person. And you know where they're going too. In thirty <laughs> yeah, K yeah. especially. You're like, you know, you see Khan as this noble figure and you know what's coming. And you are going through these books and you're seeing him develop and you just know there's a tragedy waiting for happening. Mm. And I think part of the the grab for the heresy, like the thing that really brings you in is that you know that these people don't die, but then the authors kind of have this remit to kind of tell this crazy story between now and then, and they can beat them the hell up because you know they're not going to die, but they can put them through a world of pain and torture and complication, and you're then like, well, how's this guy going to get past this? Like, how does he overcome this crazy, crazy story? And, you know, you kind of come back for more, hence 50, 60, 70 books. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And like it's all supposed to be ending here very shortly. Obviously, the Siege of Terror being the last in the series for the Horus Heresy. Um, 
Josh, like, what do you think is next? Obviously, after the Horus Heresy, oh, so after the Siege of Terror, um, excuse my ignorance, but my understanding is the Horus Heresy is quote unquote complete from like a start to end finish. But what's next? Um, is it the Age of Strife <laughs> or what is this no, more and more no. and more? So there's still a lot there in between. Um, obviously, mm. you've got to cover why Lehman Rust rode off into the warp, and you've got to cover the Khan going off to dirt bike rally with the Drakari. And, mm. and those, once again, that's the sort of thing you're looking at. What we say the characters, right? You know, there's a whole change in there. There's Gog Van Dyer coming to power and the Ecclesiarchy starting to worship the Emperor and the Sisters of Battle creation um, overthrowing Gog. And there's so many stories to tell in between that time frame. I think they're going to have content for years and years and years. Like, we've mm. still got to introduce 40K as we know it, right? Mm. Um, there's so many different little factions in there. They've got to sort of try and work in, you know, the emergence of the Tau, Leagues of Votan. They've got to try and weave those guys in now. This is sort of the problem. <laughs> Right, when you bring these new factions out, you've got to sort of prove they were there all along. Um, there's the custodies, you know, the custodies having failed their mission, painting all their armor black and hiding in the palace what they're going through. There's so many stories to sort of link those two. It's 30k, like I think someone just said in the comments, the ultimate prequel, right? Mm. Um, there's still so much. We're probably up to episode the end of episode two, about to fight uh Yoda and Count Dooku with the lightsaber battle. Um, there's still plenty to come, so I think that's probably the next step, just sort of working in on that gap, because they've got a 10,000 year gap. There's so much in there they can play mm. with. A lot of creative license there. I think they call it the scouring, the next mm. phase. So, I mean, there's so many reasons to explore those stories, and especially with the kind of the fad they're going through right now with bringing all the Primarchs back. Well, the best way to hype you for Primarchs is to tell you why they left in the first place. Where the hell did they go? Because those stories have been super vague, but then slowly fleshed out over time. And, you know, with some of the bigger characters like Gilliman and the Lion, that's easy to bring back. But when you're talking about, like, the Khan or, like, um, Valdor from the Custodes, some of those stories will, you know, people want to read about them and hear about them. So bring it on. Yeah, so sounds like there's uh, money to be made by GW, so there's still going to be plenty of uh, people <laughs> who are keen and so invested like these two here. Uh, they want to hear more about the lore, so... Look, it sounds like there's more to come and it will never end. Oh, it will, it will end maybe eventually, but it's going to take a while and there's still a lot to unravel. Um, Is it just a Warhammer lore, though, or Warhammer universe that you guys love? Or do you like other sci-fi or fantasy genres? I guess, Josh, it sounds like you are a Star Wars fan, uh, re reminiscing episode two, uh, episode two, but is uh, is that... Do you have other sci-fi fans? Yeah, fantasy? yeah. I love, you know, obviously, as a kid, Star Wars is great. I remember my dad sneaking me out of my room past bedtime to watch Empire Strikes Back as a young kid, you know, um, on TV with the ads in between. And I've gone for four hours or something crazy. Um, no, I do like, I do love those universes, but none of them just have hooked me like 40K. It's definitely also that setting once again. Don't get me wrong, you know, I love watching Star Wars and the Alien franchise and all those guys, you know, they're fantastic to watch, but. I said the 40k law is just so in depth, and it just, I said, keeps bringing me back. What about yourself, Lachlan? Is it other genres that interest you, or is it not nah, Warhammer all the way? <clears throat> well, look, War Warhammer, I think, is the big dog, but uh, Star Trek is something that really sucked me in. And once you hit Star Trek level of nerd, you can't go back, man. <laughs> You're trapped forever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of sci fi in general. So, you know, it's, 40k just makes sense it just uh kind of fell into my lap and can't get enough of it well, well, when you, well when you're not live longing and prospering i'm sure you could just go back and do this is a 40k right <laughs> too good too good so two two sci-fi parent chances just to consume all your time and energy and any free time you may, may have <laughs> beautiful um so we had some uh, questions in the chat as well so one question from brandon oh, uh, Brandon, Brendan, sorry, was uh, what's your favorite codex from a law perspective? So, uh, Josh, talking before the show, I understand you're a, a big Thousand Suns fan, uh, but who are some of your what's your favorite codex from a law perspective? Oh, uh, look, law and gameplay is going to go back a while now. The third edition chaos book, it um, was really, really cool, right? So, you used to build your squads in the god's sacred number, so you used to get uh, free war gear on your sergeants or a free banner, or I think it was, I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, but you used to you build your noise marines in sixes build your um, berserkers in eights, all this sort of stuff. I used to love it. Mm. You know, that was sort of my first entrance into the, um, the chaos world. And I just remember reading that codex cover to cover over and over and over. I used to love that one. That's definitely my favorite. What about yourself, Lachlan? Do you have a favorite codex from a law perspective? 
Kind of what one of the first that I um quite liked was I, I got into 40k fifth edition. Uh, the fifth edition Drukari Codex was awesome, and especially like just the amount of characters and stuff that they had that didn't even have models at the time that you could then you know you can go and read the stories about them in the book and then craft them. There's this guy, I can't remember his actual name, but he was essentially called the head taker. And so every time, like Brendan here, my old mate, um, we'd be playing a game amongst our mates. Anytime he killed a character, I literally got a, got one of their heads and stuck it on his face because that's what he does. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was an awesome codex. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and you touched on there, playing the game as well as listening to the law. So, Josh, you alluded to before that you play Crusade to sort of fulfill that law niche, but I understand you play other games as well. How do you balance, like, your love for the law and want to play out the narrative while playing potentially, quote-unquote, competitive Warhammer games? Do you have to, like, segregate the two, or do you just let it all intertween? Um, it's A lot of it's about the conversation you have before the game. Um, you know, obviously, when you go into a game in your local, your friendly local game store, this unspoken conversation is most time you're playing match play. This is sort of what you're doing. You know, you're playing the competitive rule set. Um, that's sort of the unspoken conversation. You don't really have a lot these days. They've sort of ironed that out a lot um, back from the days of 7th edition and it's people taking Imperial Knights that you couldn't wound. Um, so it is a lot about that conversation. You know, what do you want to get out of the game? Um, so Crusade as an example. You know, you sort of want to tell a story about these characters again. You've created this, converted this sorcerer or crevasse over there in the book cabinet. Um, and you're telling this story of how he went through when he fought off the Tyranids and fought off, you know, and tried to take the world from the Harlequins and all this sort of thing. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, so you've sort of got to, sometimes, depending on the book, sometimes you might have to wheel some stuff back, maybe not taking um, every single best option you possibly fit in the list, maybe taking some funner choices, which can be good as well. Like, sometimes it's great to take units you wouldn't normally see on the tabletop. Um and that's where it really sort of makes it feel a bit special. You're getting to use these units that you've put a lot of time and effort into. Because most of the time, you don't start the army because of the rules. You start the army because of the models. I, I set it up with a whole Necron collection because I like an optic race. Hmm. You know, hmm. one unit turned into 4,000 points. And I woke up one morning going, what am I doing? You know? <laughs> um, it's an infection. <laughs> How did I get here? <laughs> Especially, yeah, when you uh, have online shopping and it's 11 o'clock at night and a few beers in. It's dangerous. Very dangerous. Hmm. Um yeah, I love that you really... talk about yeah. like naming your characters because I think naming the, your character really brings you into the game. Like that's very much that's, so. Which that's is like I, the um, gateway, right? Interesting that Tyrannies are coming in the tenth edition box. I um, Tyrannies are sort of an interesting one because you can't really do that, right? You know, you can be the the um, spawn of Mithrax or anything like that, but you know, it's just a name for the Tyranid, not so much as their actual name. Right? It's just a biomorph that the hive mind spat out. So I find that, especially trying to play Crusade, find it a bit hard to play those sort of armies. Um, Chaos Demons is probably another one. Like it's a bit unique now that Chaos Demons have named characters, but they never used to, right? It just used to be the Bloodthirster. Um, yeah, that's really yeah. I love that sort of stuff. I don't know, Josh. I have some words for you, mate. Terry the Turvagon is going <laughs> to come at you, okay? Oh, look, the old school naming. I love like with tabletop tactics. You should do their battle reports. They have the naming for oh, B Bone. I always had his names for Terry the Turvagon. And when I played Crusade, I had my three extra cream, so they were called Ed, Ed, and Eddie. You know, just live it up. Then. <laughs> hey, so, 66 it always... tables, man. They're your friend, right? Especially if you're not into <laughs> that sort of stuff. I'm, um, I'm not into D&D at all. I could never do that sort of stuff. But those D66 tables, you roll those dice and you look at the name and you go, that's ridiculous. I love it. And it just sticks, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you can still personify your Tyranids and your, I guess, non-traditional name characters. Like I know Gene Steel Cults don't natu no, nat nat oh, naturally have like na named characters per se. So I'm sure you can find your ways. Uh, what about yourself, Lachlan? So we met at Victorian Team Champs, like mm. a competitive 2K event, but obviously with your channel, which is, um, I will have in the link description below, Legends of Law, you guys try and focus on the narrative and like sort of um, having that fun side of the game. But how do you split the, t the difference between your love for the lore and what plays out in the universe versus what plays out on the tabletop as you fail to roll sixes, unfortunately? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I still haven't mastered it, man. So, um, I uh, I keep going to comps and I'm like, you know what, this list is cool, but you know what, I'll take that unit out because that's too cool. And uh, as in like cool, I mean like compy. And uh, I'll put this thing in because that's awesome. And then I don't do well. And I'm like, well, why didn't I win? <laughs> like um, my more recent example was I'm big on CSM. Um, 
played word bearers a bit when we were when we met last year. And I just refused to put the big 10-man Terminator brick in my list. I tried it for a bit. I did a small version of it. I did every different version of it I could think of. But I just kind of – it's just so boring. It was just a boring way to play. And I, I built word bearers because possessed. I just want possessed and demons everywhere. And um, feeling like I was forced to put this 10-man brick in because, yes, it's denia- like undeniably unkillable, but it's just – it makes a boring gameplay. So, you know, I'm, I'm – constantly flipping back and forwards between should I be compy or should I not? I tend to stick on the side of uh, like lawful, but with teeth. So I've still got some grit. I'm still going to kick your ass a bit, but I'm, you know, in a truly comp game, I'm probably going to get wiped, but I'm not there for that. I'm there to have fun, roll some dice, make a cool story. And I feel like the way to bridge the gap is to really get into that character, Terry, the Turvagon or that Sergeant who could, or, that one guy who's the last stander for that that unit who's still alive and could definitely win you the game but might get flattened next turn. So, you know, I find those little moments are the things that really pull you in. Those narrative games as well, they sort of give you permission a bit to bend the rules and the sake for having a good game, right? Like, you might mm. be creaming your opponent and you go, he goes, oh, I can't make that charge. There's no way. It's a 13. I'm like, you know what? If you roll two sixes, it's all yours. And they yeah, roll mate, two just sixes it. and you both cheer and you're going off <laughs> yes. and it's fantastic. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> it's yeah, those moments. Lost game. He's lost yeah. a 60 to zero, but, you know, he's, it's that who cares? Like, they're the moments you remember, right? Or well, you're sitting uh, at the game yeah, store yeah, and the yeah. old player at the back, he's going off. He's going, wow, duck, 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 all these dice. What the hell is his problem? They're just having he's having the best fun. time ever. Yeah, he doesn't, <laughs> he's having a great time. He doesn't care. He knows it sort of thing. And those are the moments that really sort of mm. stick with you. And that's what I love getting out of the hobby. You know, you do remember that. My, I was versing my brother's Yukari the other day and he had a rack unit and I went in with this big possessed unit and I threw like 40 wounds at him and he rolled, I want to say it was 22 out of 26 feel no pain. Something stupid. And we're mm. losing our minds. <laughs> that's the sort of stuff you remember, right? And that's Absolutely. sort of what... When we talk narrative, a lot of people assume, you know, we're getting down there and we're putting nameplates on every single bloke in the squad and yeah. that's not my sort of thing. But it's just those moments that you sort of create on the table where you go, you know, I know the normal competitive rules say, let's do this, but let's bend it a little bit. Or, you know, if you can do this, you know, I'll more power to you. I'll give it to you. Hmm. Mm. I, I actually think my favourite part of narrative or casual play or when you know that the comp game is done, especially the last game of comps is often the best you know that you're out of contention for the top. You know you're not getting, like, the bottom place. You're just going to have a good game. And I very often meet my favourite person at a comp on the last game because we're in the middle somewhere. We kind of don't care where what's going to happen, and we just have a good game. It's funny really, you say that. I'm a yeah. you know big a six foot bloke, a pretty big bloke. I walk to the table. People don't know what to expect at a tournament, right? And I'm sort of like this at the table. I walk. I'm like, hey man, how are you going? I'm laughing and getting. They're going. They try the game face on. They sort of throws them off. Think it's some sort of trick. And I'm just <laughs> yeah. having the most fun out of anyone. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. And having that attitude is so important in the hobby. Like just taking it away from it what you can and just laughing at those moments. I'm sure it's very easy for you, Josh, when the guy rolled 22 out of 26 field of paints to go. You gotta be kidding me! But it's like oh, he's like, oh, he's had some fun with it. It's narrative. It's narrative. It's supposed to happen, though. <laughs> oh, too funny. Too funny. Um, but obviously, we talked about a lot uh, highly about the Warhammer universe and the law and like how it's amazing. But what are some things that GW sort of does wrong? Like, obviously, they have a wide variety of authors. Like, sometimes there's some misses in the books versus some hits. Um. Maybe starting with you, Josh, what are some things that GW just does wrong and you just ticks you off per se about what they do with the franchise? Uh, my biggest one is, funny we talk about characters so much, is they're so afraid of confrontation between characters. They want these big, epic confrontations. Scarus versus Farsight. They want um, Kalgar versus Abaddon. And then an earthquake mysteriously separates them and then they can't get in a spaceship and jump over the five-meter gap. That's yeah, they, they really... bridge the galaxy and they can't hop across a rope. Like, yeah, like I think the I think the um the far side of is literally I think an earthquake and a separate the building falls apart and they both walk away. Like, you don't want to or um how Hellbrecht versus Imitek the Stormlord. Hell Imitek the Stormlord cuts off his hand, throws him off a bridge, and he's like, ah, uh, let him go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's probably one of my more frustrating. Is just, you know, this the, the Rubricon Primaris is another one. They um. So how deadly it is. Only one out of three Marines survive, and I haven't seen a Marine die yet. 
<laughs> There's a couple no, you in just, uh, Spirit you just Emperor. Didn't know the ones example. that did die. <laughs> no, no, true. <laughs> Spirit of the Emperor. There's a guy basically on his deathbed, and they're like, "Ah, oh, he's alright. Patch him up. Put some scotch tape on there. No dramas." That's probably my biggest. And the other ones probably scale a bit. They talk about these grand battles between twenty thousand guardsmen and fifteen, and you're know, like, that, you know, there were more people in the battle, you know, an unnamed battle in World War One on Earth. You know, there's billions and billions of planets. Sometimes the scale doesn't qu- quite hit just right. Mm, yeah, no, I agree, man. I agree. And like, kill a character. I'm very okay with it. It doesn't mean you have to remove the model. You can still keep the character on the shelf. Like, why? Like, this is a vast universe where all strange, all matter of strange things happen, right? You can still bring the characters back in weird ways. I'd be, I'd feel much better about it if occasionally you just kill the guy. Like, just do it. The other ten ten thousand guys that they know just died. What about them? You know, just kill him. It's all good. <laughs> Look at Eldrad, he sprouted back out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. So um, um Battletech's obviously like a very famous miniature game and they have like for people who aren't aware, they have like various editions and like there's generally like models that fit the error or edition, but when they kill things off and bring them back, like they don't say, Oh, that's it, like you can't play with that model anymore. Like they still have editions so you can play like a certain narrative or a story which has your models in there. I think killing off characters is part of it, right? I mean Game of Thrones got very popular because they actually killed off mm. some main characters along the way, uh, which people loved and hated. But look, you can't deny that it progressed the story. Even just, yeah, progressing the story Absolutely. and having some consequences. You know, we talk about this Tyranid army that may have eaten entire other galaxies, but they can't quite finish off the uh, Ultramarine First Company. Very much having some consequences, yep. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a thick plot armor there, Joss. Thick plot armor. <laughs> Tactical <laughs> plot armor. Tactical dreadnought Tactical plot armor. Plot armor. <laughs> uh, it sounds like, though, Josh, you said more than one choice word to say about GW in terms of what they do wrong with the law, but maybe they'll fix it. So maybe, the, maybe they need to hire you up and fix up some of those issues. No, um, no. no. Easy no, throwing no, no. from the outside. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, what about yourself, Lachlan? Was there any other things that just gripe your gears about the Warhammer law? No, I actually, um, uh, I kind of agree. I, I just think no consequences. Like, it, it really does take away from it a little bit. And my, my favorite thing recently has been them bringing the actual law back into the game in a way that doesn't often feel like they're just trying to do it for dollars. And having those consequences stick around, like, you know, the 13th Crusade causing the big tear in the galaxy. And that's actually stayed for, what, two editions now? So it's nice to see the story actually advance, but they sometimes don't let it actually matter. You know, I'd love to see some new characters pop up rather than them just removing old characters, putting them into legends and then pretending they didn't exist anymore. Like give me a reason that guy's gone onto the bench. You know, I'd, I'd actually like to see that. So there's, there's no consequences yeah. and it, it takes away from it. Sure. Fair enough. Um, We have a question in the chat and this will probably start like our, wrapping things up or wrapping things up in terms of like a rapid fire segment of like those quick fire questions that you've got to ask them. Um, so Aiden has asked like, what are some of your favorite bits of really obscure law? So start with you, Josh, is there some like, little favorite bits of snippets of obscure law that you just Absolutely. eat up? My, my favorite is the gene stealer cult. Um, so I don't know if you know much about the gene stealer cult. So they, um, it starts off with the gene stealer landing on a planet. He injects a guy with some of his DNA. He goes on and has kids. He spreads the cult. So basically they're psychically hmm. linked to this patriarch. So what happens is they obviously all rise up and they go, our star saviors are here, the Tyranids are here. They build up this psychic resonance till the Tyranids decide to not beat the planet. And then right as the Tyranids arrive, obviously the um, the gene stealer who started it all is just a gene stealer. So he goes back under the control of the, the hive mind. And then the people who became part of the gene stealer cult have you know a couple of moments to sort of realize what they are and what they've done before the Tyranids eat them as well. <laughs> it's fantastic. Favorite bit of lore. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's just like ultimate tubes there. Like nothing yeah, good they go, can happen. What have we done? And they look down and he's a hum again with a big smile on his face waiting for him. <laughs> Too good. What about yourself, Lachlan? Any really obscure favorite bits of lore? Yeah, um, it's not talked about enough, but I mean, Marines, Space Marines are cannibals. They kind of slide past it, ignore it, forget about it, but they're all cannibals. <laughs> Love a bit of brain. <laughs> just chomp on that brain, gain some knowledge, carry on. I did no, not know it. that. There we go. Really? Fun facts. No, I did not know that yeah, at it's all. It's a homophagia gland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can eat, uh, it's almost not quite as well as crew, but they can eat part of the victim and gain their memories. And yeah, really, and blood angels can do it through blood, obviously. Yeah. 
Right, but they're not are. vampires, right? They're not vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Some weird physiology, oh. that's for sure. Hmm. Oh, well, there we go. Next time I'm in the 40k law competition, I'll remember that one. Home of feature. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> they all get one extra point. Hoorah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still come dead last, but... Do they exist? <laughs> 40k law cops? I'd love that. At the biggest. Look at, look at um, Uprising Adelaide. Uh, Adam Napier always does like a trivia night, the oh, really? second night or whatever like that. And there was always a law component and I was terrible every time. <laughs> but there's some people out there that do really well. So you'll get it, mate. You'll come get out. I'll yeah, get them eventually. To. I'll watch enough Wes Hammer TikToks and all the other stuff and I'll get there, baby. It's only a matter of time. I believe. Only a matter of time. Uh, speaking of content creators and uh, people who out there um, who create YouTube videos and shorts, Josh, who's your favorite content creator out there who creates some lore or narrative? Um, not so much a law, like a, um, a law content provider, but I actually quite enjoy the, uh, the play on 40 K guys. They do a lot with, um, they set up these amazing tables, um, using dry ice terrain they've handcrafted. There's one of a beach where they've literally made the entire board into a beach. It's the love and dedication they sort of put into those. And they do tell a story. Um, and it's really cool to see. And the boys get so excited. You sort of like, like I said, you sort of get wrapped up in the excitement. You're like. Yeah, you know, I don't personally. I'm not a huge fan of the Tower Law. Um, I don't. I don't think I've looked into it enough. It's sort of my favorite army, but you, you like it. Fantastic. Here's this battle suit commander. You don't know why you're excited, but you're excited about him anyway. Those guys make some really great. Um, more. I said more friendly focused battle reports. Yeah, it's just fun, right? Mm, it's absolutely. Actually, 40k for fun rather than for super seriousness. And I think super seriousness kills a game like this because it's, it's supposed to be so. fun and it's good at a top table if you want to be serious and get it done right but that's a very small percentage of games and interactions right that's sort of hard to yeah. uh, forget sometimes obviously the minority is the loudest right so we obviously we live in this sort of we live in this world of warhammer there's hundreds of thousands of other people out there you know you think it's just a fun game they pick up a model a couple of times a year and hmm yeah, absolutely. What about yourself, Lockett? Any favorite content creators out there that um, you like to plug, per se? Um, funnily enough, I don't watch or listen to too many different content creators in terms of lore. One of my favorite lore sources, though, would be probably lexicanum.com. They just have so much on there. Every time I'm, like, fiending for a bit of knowledge or there's, like, a little bit that I want to hear about or don't know about, I go there and there's just so much stuff. And there's in every article, it's pretty much a Wikipedia of 40K, and there's just links to other stuff and other stuff, and suddenly you're just down the rabbit hole reading about Marines eating brains, and you don't know how you got there. <laughs> uh, too good. And it, it, those online articles are so good. Like, it's a data repository that, to be able to link things. Like, because sometimes in the law, you read about something, it's like, what the hell is this? Like, you talk mm. about the Rubicon. It's like, what the hell is a Rubicon? You click on the link, it's like, oh, that's a Rubicon. And I can go back to what the original thing is. So, yeah, those are fantastic. Um, Oh, uh, Mr. Dale Summer, he's, he says he's a Luton fanboy. He's got that silky voice. So uh, plenty of content creators out there. And I think for people who want to listen to Age of Sigma, I'd highly recommend 2 Plus Tough. He does Age of Sigma, mm. but as well as Horus Heresy and 40K. And he just has a really good way of summarizing things. And it's just that mm. perfect, I guess, um, uh, 30 minute, 20 minute video of like sometimes characters, little snippets of those codexes, which are fantastic. And I know he's doing the horror series now, like like 30 minute, 30 minute reviews of each book, or actually it's an hour, sorry, an hour of each book, but he summarizes it very well with his partner. So definitely someone I recommend for anyone mm. who's curious. So, uh, yeah, um, the da, 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 next one. So who, so starting with yourself, Josh, who is the best and who is the worst Primark in the law? Mm. Yeah, controversial, I'm sure, but. Conrad Kurz is the best, and Lehman Russ is the worst. <laughs> Eat that one, boys. Mm. <laughs> oh, mate, Josh, you've won my heart already. Night Lords are my favourite CSM faction. I love Fantastic. Conrad Kurz, so you'll have you'll have no worries for me. What about yourself, Lockwood? Oh, the Khan is the best, mate. He's just a, a weapon. He doesn't boast. He doesn't, you know, he's not too cocky. He just is quiet. And then someone picks a bone with him, and he will cut your head off. <laughs> Um, I think Ferris is the worst. I think they've done him dirty. Um, they probably should have had a book or so about him before butchering him, or at least after butchering him. But they kind of haven't really done him justice. And so I feel like he's just not fleshed out. I don't feel like I know him. Of all the Primarchs, he's the one that I'm just the least interested in. You know? I think the original timeline had them only for five books, three books. 
which mm. is sort of, I think, obviously, they had the consequences, and they were like, hang on, let's expand this out 40-odd uh, <laughs> books later, and Ferris mm. Manners was sort of left in the dust at the start. Just kind of didn't come back, despite, you know, this entire series being like a prequel to 40K itself. They can't even prequel themselves. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like they should actually flesh him out a little bit. I know there is a book about him, but, yeah. Yeah, so what, um, I guess, uh, expanding a bit more there, Josh, you talked Comrade Kurtz is your favourite. What makes him your favourite? And then why is Lehman Russ such a scrub and just the worst? Mate, murder Batman. What more could you want? <laughs> um, he's actually quite interesting. Obviously, on the surface, like I said, you go, murder Batman, he's crazy, he skins people alive, all the rest. Um, he's actually, it's sort of interesting. He's in this place where he was created to do this role. Emperor, The Emperor created these Primarchs, each to fulfil a role. And he had a role for terror tactics. Um, not shock assault like the world leaders, but terror tactics because the Night Lords could make whole systems submit by just turning up and they knew what they were about. Yet he was sort of condemned um, for doing this, right? You know, all the other Primarchs wouldn't go near him for the most part. They, you know, he had these visions of his death like Sanguinius, but no one cared sort of thing. He, you know, In the end, he sort of set out to prove that he was right to get some um, validation. He's just a really interesting Primarch from that point of view, sort of being made to do something and then scorned for doing it. Um, condemned oh. for living his purpose right absolutely you know? absolutely especially you know towards the end and just seeing him descend into madness and building emperors out of uh servants and yeah it's all sorts of weird stuff lehman russ i just he's just a hammer in the horus heresy he's sort of obviously it's maybe for future character development where he turns into this wise odin character but sort of where oh, my gathering of the law from him he just yeah, he's just hot-headed and just charges straight in and sometimes they don't make sense sort of thing, the things he's doing. Or you read Thousand Sons and you go, why is he doing that for? Or Not quite yeah, yeah. not quite my favourite. Fair enough, fair enough. He's a scrub. F- bugger him. <laughs> Losers. No. Uh, what, mm. what yourself, Lachlan? Obviously, Conrad... Oh, not Conrad. Of course, um, Khan, the Khan himself for White Skies. What makes him such a love for you? And like then why is um, Ferris Manners just... Just the worst. I mean, other than losing his head, I mean, sorry. <laughs> with a giant collar on. Yeah, he's a bit, bit endless. Um, the, the Khan, he's just the patient hunter. And, you know, that there's something mysterious about that. He doesn't he doesn't kind of get any, anyone's face. He doesn't, like, pick any beef with anyone. He doesn't, like, start anything. He's just there. He's just the best at what he does. And most of the other Primarchs who consider themselves great swordsmen all go, yeah, but the Khan exists, and I'm not sure if I could beat him. They don't know because he doesn't talk. He just stays in his lane, does his job, and is really bloody good at it. And I respect that. So, uh, But for Ferris, it's just, I don't know, the, the times they've written him that I've read, he just seems like a grumpy old twat and um, doesn't really bring much character. I may have missed a few bits of lore that really flesh him out, but he just doesn't do anything for me, you know. Just kind of boring and grumpy and stale, and I don't even understand why Fulgrim loved him. And I've absorbed quite a bit of law, and I still don't know. So I probably will never. Fair enough. Maybe maybe we'll find out, but we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, who is the best and worst faction in regards to the law? Starting with yourself, Josh. Like, who's got the the, the best law from a faction perspective? I hear Ultramarines, despite being the poster child of DJW and being boring as batshit in my eyes, they're actually kind of cool in the law for the Horus Heresy. Um, but who are the best and who are the worst? I won't talk about Ultramarines in case Paul's listening. Um, best faction, probably in the law, actually. I'm going to take a weird one for a Chaos Space player. The Eldar, probably. Um, it's funny, the Eldar in the law haven't changed in the 40 years of Warhammer. They, they, Jess Goodwin wrote this. <laughs> sorry. Jess Goodwin wrote this story 40 <laughs> odd years ago. And it's stuck. And it's quite an interesting story. It talks about um, excess and consequences and. You know what you know eventually you know where we're heading sort of thing um the old art law is really really fascinating and that you know these days they could like they've retconned some stuff from the other factions you know chaos space marines and abaddon's 13 black crusades they've changed that law um you know they've gone back and changed some of the primark law but that elder storyline has just stayed the same the entire time so it's really quite fascinating to see over 40 years a story that's, that's written so well it's still sticking um the worst faction in the law is kind of a tough one i um sort of default to leagues of otan only because they haven't been fleshed out yet they were sort of dropped and um not really supported on the law side they sort of they're here now off you go um but i'm sure that'll change going forward i know there's a book coming out for them soon i think um not really my thing i'm not big into dwarves i'm more of a um much more of a chaos player 
No, nah, they, they suck. Who who likes the Wolves? The squats are useless. I mean, I hate them when I play them in fantasy, and I still hate them today when I play against both hands. So screw them. And then Stop but Elder are, yeah, no. uh, Elder are great. And um, maybe if the Exodite rumors are true, it'd be great to hear about elves riding dinosaurs. And we've got to flesh out that more, right? Elves riding dinosaurs. I mean, come on. Come on. What, yeah, give, what's it, what give it to me. Doing? Take my money. Who's the best and worst faction in regards to the law? Look, CSM will always have my heart. I'm a chaos boy through and through, I think. Um, but Drakari, I think, are my favourite. They're just really interesting. They're cunning. They're always at war with it, with themselves and the rest of the universe. And, you know, if you ever read any of their lore, you're not safe from anyone you know ever. They are always prepared and like laying plots and traps for people that they know in case they come to try and usurp them or take what's theirs. And so, yeah, they, I just find them awesome. Like they, they got some cool stories and uh, I just love it. Uh, as for worst, I kind of, I don't really like the Nids or Necrons. I like them as playable factions. Like I like what they represent, but I find in the lore, it doesn't shine through enough. Like the, the, the endless swarm it was like, well, how do, how do you counter that? There's no downside to it. It's just this endless tide of things that eat, 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 and just absorb, 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 absorb. absorb. Like, what's the weakness? <laughs> the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin they find out in the cave in the desert that miraculously disables the Tyranid Horde, right? Yeah. There's yes. always some sort of something like that. And I, I don't like that there's not an obvious downside because the, the beauty of a lot of the marine factions is they have a huge upside and then a huge flaw. And that's actually what makes them kind of grounded in reality and kind of relatable reality. And, um, <laughs> you know, so it, it kind of makes it relatable. Whereas things like the Nids or the Necrons, it's just, they're just supposed to be endless. And I find the Necrons, they, te- they tend to push off a bit and go, oh, they conquered. And then they just went back to sleep. And, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't really wrap the story up very well. So I'd, I'd like to see the Necrons get a little bit more character and the Have Nids you- get a, a real weakness, you know. Have you read uh, Infinite and the Divine? No, I, I'm keen to, though. Definitely have a read of that one. If you like the two old men from the Muppets, that'll be uh, <laughs> it's an interesting read for Necrons. Going on the list. Going on the list. Excellent. Yeah, I was about to mention, like, Trades in the Infinite is supposed to be amazing in the Infinite and the Divine. Mm. Like, it's supposed to be it's a fantastic. fun... It's fantastic. It's, I think, one of the most wackiest books ever, but it's hilarious and, like, like a really good read. So definitely something Absolutely. to recommend. I've heard nothing really good things about it. it. There you go. Add it to the list. Um... But speaking of uh, books, favorite book of the Horus Heresy. So from like your personal favorite, it doesn't have to be the best book, but just something you love. Starting with yourself, Josh. Who's your favorite, or what is your favorite? Oh, uh, it's a tie between Betrayer and Flight of the Eisenstein. To be honest, I um, Flight of the Eisenstein. When you re- a lot of people struggle with those first couple of books. When you hear Flight of the Eisenstein, you meet Nathaniel Garrow, who's this big hero figure. You know, he's in the Death Guard Legion, which you have already pre sort of imagine, the, you know, you know what the Death Guard look like. I don't need to describe that to you. But he's a shining hero that have come out of the Death Guard book who knows what's right and wrong and, you know, stands the line against the traitors with Saul Tarvitz and all these sort of things. So that book really sort of um, put the wind in my sails for the heresy. I said, I, um, I just finished Fulgrim where they're... <laughs> I can't spoil it, sorry. But they're doing some painting. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, it's getting kind of intense. And, <laughs> um... <laughs> And then I hit Fly the Odds on. Here's his character you can sort of relate to, and he's got these um, humans, which is they do. I think they do a lot in Black Library. They put a human in the situation, so you have someone to relate to. Mm. Um, it sort of yeah, it gives you a great perspective on some of the heroes. So, and then Betrayer, Betrayer is just it's definitely one of the books that's harped on about the most in the law. Um, really follows that story behind Angra on Khan and the word bearers um, marching through the McCrag systems. Um, and it is, it's not like even Robert Gilliman in there gets a pretty good rap at the end there. He, um, you see a different side of him. It's just, it's a fantastic book. And it, I know a lot of people harp on about that one. So I was sort of nervous to put that one there, but fly the Eisenstein, if not. Well, the fair note, whatever you like, whatever you like. What about yourself, Lachlan? What, is, what are your favorite books from the Horus Heresy? Well, I, I can't not say First Heretic. It is absolutely my favorite thing i mentioned it earlier it's an incredible book you go on a journey with a guy he turns to the dark side or what seems to be the dark side and he does it in a way that's relatable he doesn't like toss away his character he doesn't do it for some fickle means he just kind of gets swept up in this path that leads him there and then he does his best to handle it and 
uh, I loved it. The other one, other two that really stood out were um, The Thousand Sons. That's an incredible book. And both of those really stand alone. Like you could just read one of those on their own and go, cool, awesome story, put it down and never read any more Heresy again. And um, I, I love them. Uh, Unremembered Empire as well. Just the massive merging of so many storylines from like 20 or 30 books before it all coalescing at once and then bouncing off into a hundred different directions at the same time with, you know, several big legions and big players all coming together for like a new plot that I don't think they fleshed out until they got just before that. So I think, you know, after they realized that the, the energy was there behind the heresy, they said, you know what, time for phase two. And that seems like it was unremembered empire. You get a lot about, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Corvus. Um, <laughs> Cor out of mind like and um and the and sanguinius who's also one of my favorite primarchs gilliman the lion heaps of people lots of big names and you know you just get some cool storylines that branch off that for like another 10 or 15 books afterwards fantastic um uh, that sounds awesome uh one thing that's always fun about the law and like we always talk about in 40k is memes and all the jokes and all the funny sayings we have we always have to ask the question that you ask for this one but what's like your favorite 40k or horace heresy meme um, obviously, we talk about the, the Tau being communists and space fish, and um, <laughs> Dark Angels are always chaos. Um, I always love that one myself. Like I know it's just easy bait, but I just love using it all the time, even <laughs> though it's overused all the time. But like, what's your favorite? Start with yourself, Josh. What's like your favorite 40K or Horace Heresy meme or joke that's always <sighs> referred to? My favorite one specifically, you know, I'll just go down to the actual meme level, is the one of the Dark Angel tripping over. And he looks up to his brother and he goes, brother, help, I've fallen. And then his brother's loading the puzzle <laughs> pistol. And he's like, brother, what are you doing? <laughs> so, always gets a laugh out of me, that one. Oh, it's tough, man. Like, you sort of just, you don't really think about him looking back. Um, oh, yeah, Bobby Jean anyway is good now. Oh, yeah, I just definitely the faller one. You know, you just, as a, I have Dark Angels. My first two armies were World Eaters and Dark Angels. And everyone was like, oh, you're an avid Chaos player. You're like, ah, and you sort of just learn to embrace it. You're like, right, I'm moving on. Come on. Uh, that's actually, I've never heard that one. I've probably never really. Before. Right. I've never heard it. That's great. Uh, Dale it's... referred to Bobby G and his other anime girl. So referred to your yeah. brain. Um, so it's got to be that or the uh, the ex reactive explosive armor one that's going around at the moment. That's still getting a chuckle out of me where the, um, the soldiers are just slapping things on a stuff that doesn't help at all. Um, there was one the other day. Oh, I can't remember. It. Anyways, we'll move on from that. Um, that was there's some good one guardsmen ones out there. Yeah, well, they're just slapping like, like basilisk tyrants on the walls, and they're just the commissars just frowning at them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a really cheeky guardsman grin that sometimes pops up at a really great moment. Like someone just places it very well in like a real world law situation. And suddenly, this, is this guardsman's grin for like <laughs> you got no idea what pain is. <laughs> the um the probably best series if you've ever seen M whatnot. Um, he does these amazing comics where he makes 40k scenes out of a movie, but he's always there's they are essentially memes, I suppose. And he always hides like an Alpha Legion in there. There's always at least one Alpha Legion somewhere in the photo, sometimes in a reflection of a screen on a window, or but they're fantastic too. So, and whatnot's fantastic for memes. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, the biggest question of the all the, the, the topic of all discussion, the thing we've all been waiting for. So, did Magnus do anything wrong? We always hear of this whole situation of did Magnus do anything wrong? Uh, for people unaware, he may or may not do anything wrong. Discuss. Josh, did he do anything wrong as a big Thousand Suns fan? As a Thousand Suns player, this is going to be an interesting one. So <laughs> trying to contact the Emperor, which is what a lot of people talk about, maybe not in the wrong there. He went wrong way before that, man. He was talking to Zinch. He gave up an eye. He was like shaking hands with the devil. He was practicing sorcery on the side at a secret library. He went wrong way before the council and that decision to try and contact the Emperor. Oh, yeah, as a Thousand Suns player, probably not a popular opinion, but <laughs> can't disagree with that. You disagree? You did nothing wrong? No, no, I, I can't. I can't disagree oh, with that. I'll disagree. So, <laughs> like the focus is obviously always on was it wrong to call daddy? Like, no, but he he yeah, he went wrong way before that. He he messed up. He did big time. Yeah, Thousand Sons and um Prospero Burns are the two. I don't know, you maybe seen you don't know. There's two books in the Horus Heresy. One covers the Thousand Sons defending as the Space Wolves, and they're both really heavily biased. And the other one is from the Space Wolf perspective, and they're pretty great reads to read one after the other, and you're like, oh, those damned Space Wolves are uh, B-A-S-T-R-D. 
and you go, wait, hang on, and you read the other book, and you're like, hang on, maybe the Thousand Suns, it's their fault. It's just, yeah, so they can't, Black Library can't even agree, so. Yeah, and that's an awesome little twin story. Like, it's not often that you get a narrative that's so large and so deep that you can actually get two sides of the same story from two completely different perspectives. So, yeah, that's an, that's an awesome little part of the, the heresy. That sounds like that old skipper old meme. It's like, are we the bad guys? That little, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> what are you leaving? Like, oh, what? <laughs> Very much so. Uh, <laughs> uh, too good, too good. Uh, to wrap things up, I mean, the talk of the town that was for a while, um, alongside Josh and Lachlan, uh, very famous stars. Henry Cavill is a massive Warhammer hero. He's someone who loves the lore, always talks about custodes and how amazing they are. But uh, And he's been signed up to allegedly do uh, Amazon TV series of sorts. Um, mm. For people who aren't in the know, like, what should Henry Cavill cover? Or like, what should this Amazon TV series cover, as you think, from a like, lore perspective? Um, what's your, your number one choice to get really people into the lore and get people invested in? So we have more and more nerds like us. Josh, start with yourself. Like, what is your, your recommended story that Henry Cavill and crew should introduce? Maybe controversial, maybe not. I don't, a lot of people think the Horus Heresy, and I think that'd be a terrible way to sort of start. I think the Horus Heresy really loses some of its, um, some of its appeal if you don't understand the 40k setting first. Um, maybe Eisenhorn, if any, Eisenhorn the Inquisitor 100%. is a great place to start. Um, 100%. especially it does focus on that one character, and you could have the side characters, and they are, it's like a revolving door in some stories. Eisenhorn would be a good one. Um, maybe Spear of the Emperor, but that's obviously set up for Primaris, so that will maybe confuse some people. Um, it's obviously hard because, as we often say, there's no good guys in 40k. Um, so it's sort of hard to pick one story, but I think Eisenhorn would definitely be the place to start. I gotta agree, man. Like, I was gonna say the same thing. Eisenhorn is like, I haven't read it yet myself, I've been kind of saving it, but from what I know about the stories, it it's not too crazy in terms of. 40k is wild and vast and there's so much going on right but you can relate to a human going through this wild and crazy universe whereas if you start with a space marine you can't understand the sheer like bizarreness of what they actually are like one space marine is supposed to be able to solo you know a few hundred guardsmen on their own whereas if you're following one man and they come across a space marine it'll be an epic moment in the series rather than starting the series at the top of like what is crazy and what is possible or at least high up not, not necessarily the top but space marines are supposed to be these beasts these absolute weapons and if you start there you can't go up as high whereas if you start with a human going on an adventure in this wild universe there's so many other places that you can go and it'll be so much more relatable i think yeah or well, it could be the tenth if everyone knows the tenth first and only mm. or it could be um kyphus kane there are so many good human stories out there. It seems, yeah, especially you don't really get that scale. If you start with the space marine, you're eight foot looking down, whereas a human, you're six foot looking up, sort of thing, which really sort of mm. give a good first impression. Yeah, sh show the brutality of this crazy 40k universe, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, but well, alluding to that, so obviously Warhammer Plus came out and they've done a bunch of short stories and animations and stuff like that. Um, so a little bit of a tangent, but. Josh, I don't know. Have you watched any of the Warhammer Plus like animated TV shows or heard yep, about them? Yep, I've given yeah. it a go. I'm personally not the biggest fan of animated stuff. I um, but I've given it a go, and I said the content's quite good. Um, but yeah, I, it's not sort of up my alley. I said I much prefer my books and sort of imagining it. Sometimes it's sort of interesting when they a lot of the Black Library guys create um like a mystery and mystery is great to have right they, they could show you 99 artifacts in the hall and what they do but they said they're 100 locked behind a door and you'll never get access to it and you're like well, why, why is it behind that door why can't i get mm -hmm. access to it right so sometimes you sort of you, you see something and you go oh that's not how i imagined it and especially when we've had so many years of reading books and stuff i um yeah you, know, you sort of think of it in a way and then they challenge that by doing something different you're like uh like i don't mind it it's not really up my alley though but it's only good for the hobby, right? I mean, there are a lot of people that enjoy that. Um, and expanding the hobby is only good. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. How about yourself, Lockwood? Like, have you been watching any of those Warhammer Plus things? Or Yeah, yeah, I have. I watched a bit of it. Um, I you know, foolishly kept my subscription so I can get that cool sniper model, <laughs> which I'm sure 50 of us did. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like Warhammer Plus has been a letdown. When they launched it, they punched out all these big names and titles and there's this big promise that comes along with it. You know, you'll get this model and you'll have all these cool shows to watch and they just drip fed it. And I'm, no one's surprised, right? But the rate at which they drip fed it has just been disappointing. 
It's been pretty much two years now since they released it. It launched in July or August two years ago. And it's it's just been very, very slow. And I'm a bit the same as Josh. I mean, I'm not huge on the animated stuff. I, I like it and appreciate it when it's a good story or it's well executed. I've done, I've watched the Blood Angels one. That was pretty good. Um, there's one or two other series I watched that I can't remember the names of, but the fact that I can't remember the name kind of shows you that, you know, it's hard to get invested in, even though I spent quite a bit of time listening to it or watching it. And, you know, that they really came out with this big suite of titles and we haven't seen it. Where is it? You know? Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Look, maybe hope for the improve in the future and um, get, get, get a kick up the backside and maybe flesh those out a bit more and get uh, spread out the goodness of the Warhammer lore. Uh, like like the Tao communism spread the spread the good <laughs> word right <laughs> uh, absolutely to, absolutely um but before we wrap things up we'll spread the good word and so final plugs and shout outs so starting with yourself Lachlan um you got ledgers and law there but like hmm. any final plugs or shout outs you want to say and I, I believe you have an announcement if you want to discuss it yeah, yeah yeah so it's not the most exciting of announcements but um if you want to go check us out go to YouTube uh just type in legends and law oh there we go thanks mate um We've just got a little community going on. We film uh, lawful kind of battle reports. It's mostly a bit of fun. It gets comp compy occasionally, but generally we're there for a good story and a good time. And it's mostly just a group, like a bunch of mates doing some really cool videography. And uh, yeah, so come and join us. Have a have a suss of our content. We've been doing it for about two years now, and we just have a great time. But unfortunately, we have decided to call a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, we've been a little bit burning the candle at both ends and it's time to just kind of step back from it a bit. One of our guys who's really the the spine of our you know whole project is just, he's just been working too hard and we're going to take a step back for a while. We're going to reassess and then see where we're at. It's probably the end of our phase of doing battle reports for now, but we're going to see where we're at in a little while and, you know, if we want to carry on, do some something different maybe and see what, See what's going on at that time so you know there's a lot of content there if anyone's keen and uh on june june 10th at midday which i think is a saturday we're going to do our last big stream game so come and check us out we're gonna you know do some interesting stuff it won't be traditional 40k but we're it'd be very 40k at the same time we like to put a good twist on a game change the rules up mix it up keep it interesting and so come and join us and uh hopefully you know, we'll see some of you there. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, sad to see you going highest, but I'm sure hopefully it comes back in whatever form it does. And um, there's still a bunch of great battle reports there with great narrative and well-produced content there so people consume and enjoy, which I know Josh has done himself uh, after learning about it also. Happy days. Um, Josh, any final plugs or shout-outs? No, mate, obviously down under, guys. Um, so I'd love the work. Keep it up. Um, you'll find me in the book channel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always chatting about books between Nathan, Paul, and I. I said, feel free to drop in and ask any questions. Um, always around. Sounds good. I have to drop in and just ask questions like, be my own, your own chat, be chat GPT. Just answer all the 40K law <laughs> for me, right? There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> Get yeah, one of those Discord uh, bots, old... like at law experts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be at the law event and just text me under the table. <laughs> there we go. Happy days, happy days. And um, before we wrap things up, so obviously shout out down on the 40k. And as Josh is brilliantly doing so with his shirt, he's got it all nice and speaky. So um, we're on the down on 40k network. So uh, we're also a Patreon with us, guys. So to create content and stuff like that, it's not cheap. And it doesn't. It does cost money. So um, any support you can go goes a long way. Uh, obviously, the down on 40k guys host a bunch of events. You get early bird access to tickets. So when those RTTs or GTs come out, get those early bird tickets and get in before everyone else tries to do so. Uh, D6 Designs AU, a beautiful bunch of lads from, a uh, beautiful lad, from, I guess, from the Hunter region. He creates some beautiful dice. It's got awesome symbols and stuff like that. It's amazing. 100% recommend. And uh, then last but not least, Emperor. So emperor.cc, get uh, some discount off your good old hobbies. Um, needs, I mean, 10th edition's around the corner. What better way to start 10th edition by getting some good old plastic crack uh, or whatever hobby <laughs> needs you need. So uh, thank you very much, gents, for the tap tonight. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. I've learned a lot, and I'm glad to see the hobby uh, being expounded in other ways, not just on the tabletop, but also in the books and in the audibles. So really, really appreciate it. And I, I think I'm going to have to go around now and go listen to some Chapter Master Falrak or some content creator <laughs> and get really into it. So really, really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for uh, participating in the chat tonight. And uh, look forward to hearing from you all next time. So thanks, everyone, and goodbye.